it's time to hear something from the workshops today. And I would like to invite uh, four leaders from four workshops, A, B, C, D, up to the stage. Please welcome all of you. You will have to introduce yourselves and you will have five minutes on the clock to present uh, the findings of today. Very welcome. Are you A? I'm A. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Aron. I'm, I'm Yuan Rung. I'm here to talk to you about the first workshop, the Precision Medicine Workshop. I'm not sure if, I'm supposed, if everyone is supposed to come up on stage now. Uh, you, it's okay. You can okay, stay there. Okay, I'll just start. In that case, I need the next slide. Oh, I'm doing the slides. <laughs> this is, you learn something new every day. I was back. Hmm. Do I get some slides here somewhere? Oh, there we go. All right, so here are some of the things that we talked about in, in the workshop. So we were working in smaller groups that were interacting to identify obstacles and needs and possibilities for, for precision medicine, really to turn the hype to hope, as our inspirational speaker put it. And uh, so we had, I actually don't see them here, so I need to do like this. We talked about data standards, and data standards is really something that can affect this very much. Uh, data standards to, will improve the interoperability and will improve for people to actually be able to access their own data. So this is work that more or less everyone should be involved in, all the clinicians from ethicists, legal teams, and so on. And this, some of this work is already underway in places like the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health work on, on developing data standards. We talked about cross-disciplinary collaboration, and uh, this is something that should be done both uh, nationally and internationally um, to make sure that we can really uh, uh, work across the borders and, and get a better informed, more precise idea about health for a person. In prospective clinical trials, we said that that's needed prospective and other types of clinical trials to be able to go from anecdotes to, to more evidence. And, uh, on consent handling. We think this is something that's very important, and new ways to deal with consent handling. Uh, for instance, dynamic consent and, and uh, consent coding to be able to work uh, in, a, in a sort of electronic way with consent. So if you get the next slide. So for data standards, interoperability is certainly one of the things that's very important for, for precision medicine, to be able to work and to share data in a responsible way um, between research and clinical care, but also across uh, globally. So also this has effects on the personal level because you, this enables patients to get a better idea about their own data. You can access the data, you can interpret your own data if you know the standards by which they have been stored. For the cross-disciplinary collaboration, I mean, of course, this will give you a more precise understanding, like I said, and also improved understanding of your own health, the whole, the whole picture, so to speak. Uh, prospective clinical trials, We'll have more evidence-based drugs, hopefully, with less side effects, and also you'll have a much wider choice of, of uh, uh, what to choose for your health decisions. For the consent handling, again, this improves transparency and, and improves how you can access and, and your own data and how you can share the data. And this, of course, benefits everyone involved and puts the power of, of decisions on the data in the hand of the patients, both to uh, restrict, but also to increase how the data can be used. So that's from the first workshop, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have uh, one and a half minutes for comments, applause. Okay. Uh, was there any specific discussion in your, in your uh, workshop, something that was a lot discussed? If you would like to share? Yeah, actually, I mean, one thing that we, we talked about is that there was much more focus on, on data management and data sharing than on sort of... That was much of the focus on the workshop, actually. We was talked that of, good? Yeah, I think it was a good workshop. It, it, we, we talked about quite a lot of different issues. Actually. Thank you very nice. much, Johan. Thank, Thank you. you.
Now it's time for workshop B, Biobanking for Global Cancer Care. And here to present, please introduce yourself. Hello everyone, my name is Thomas Klingström and uh, I can often uh, act as Eric's chosen representative on specific tasks including biobanking. And I've been organizing the workshop together with him. And on the workshop, on the workshop for global biobanking, suggestion number one, build biobanks. And in order to build a successful biobank, you need to rely on a very large number of stakeholders. You need sustainable long-term funding because a biobank does not pay off itself within the time frame of a normal research project, which are usually funded for three to five years. And then, of course, you also need researchers, both to set the, up the biobank, but also, more importantly, to use the biobank. And then you also must have the support of pu the public, because a biobank can very, very easily become controversial. If you mishandle the data, that means that we have leaked sensitive personal information, and we'll have enormous critique about that, especially in, that in regions where you have several different ethnicities or other groups that might be discriminated against. It's very important that we handle data with care, and that also includes the data dissemination. And a biobank can be initiated by, basically, I would, in this case, I called it an activist, but it can be a researcher, it can be per patient interest organizations, it can be persons within the government to realize that we can streamline research efforts to get more benefit out of every euro or krona spent on the research. Point number two, transitioning from sample storage to data banking. I think the UK Biobank is perhaps the most glorious example of where they integrate both sample handling with doing something with the data that researchers return and publish after they have done the research using the biobank samples. And this is especially important for global cancer care because we have reached a situation where many research projects collect samples, put it into a biobank, and if the biobank is located in a low- or middle-income country, there's a very high risk that either the samples or the, relevant, or the data generated from the samples leaves the country, are analyzed somewhere else, researchers at that other location get all the credit, and the country which, where the data generate, was then generated from, they do not even have the money necessary to pay for any medical treatments generated by the samples collected in the country. And this is important that both the researchers push for these kind of structures to be initiated and also funding bodies making sure that there is an incentive to do the data management in a better way. We also, it's also very important that we publish the success stories of biobanking because biobanked samples provide us with a lot of valuable population data and it has also been a key contributor to projects like, for example, in the Gambia. We had an example from the biobank there, where knowledge about knowledge generated from the samples helped them to decide to focus on hepatitis B virus vaccination, because that is an important way to reduce the burden of liver cancer. And this is something that both researchers and patient organizations need to work with. And finally, we need to encourage the usage of biobanks, because many researchers, the first thing they do is collect samples or apply for money to collect samples, when it would perhaps be more logical to look at what biobanks are available and request samples from the biobanks, because then you get the quality metrics and you know that you will have the samples. And if we move over to the next slide. Perfect. So, biobanks, if we need to speed up a bit. So, I would say that the right wing, rightmost column is the most important on the concept of building biobanks, because there are so many health decisions that you need to make when you know more. And especially for patients who, or people who are not even patients yet, they just know that, okay, I have a significant, significantly increased risk of getting a kind of cancer. 
Angelina Jolie and her removal of, removal of her breasts are perhaps the best example of this kind of problem. And it's very sensitive and something that when we do more and more predictive medicine, then we need to have a healthcare system designed to support patients with good decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, you got your five minutes almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. so, so I will go to the next one. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next one is workshop C, the clinical value and pri price setting for new cancer drugs. And to present it is Professor Lars Löv from Region Uppsala and New Therapies Council. Thank Welcome. you, thank you. Uh, very much. Uh, uh, thanks to the participants, it was really an active and enthusiastic group with a lot of suggestions, so we have to, to separate out to uh, reach three of them. And the, the common rail for this were you need to uh, work with an international perspective, you can't stand alone. And it's a long time perspective. It's not one year, it's 10, uh, maybe more realistic, 20 years before reaching these goals. Because some of the rails that need to drive trains on has to be laid before we can drive a train and before we can collect knowledge and, and all these things we are, were dealing with. I, th I think I stand here. The first suggestion is that we need kind of a central price setting models in uh, Europe or in the long run also international uh, uh, with an evidence-based standards for reimburs uh, reimbursements. And uh, we think it's necessary because today we act very differently between different countries and we can't support and sh share knowledge about these very, very complicated processes. And uh, of course, regulatory authorities, HTA uh, and uh, companies, the uh, EC Parliament, uh, and uh, uh, also the payers and governments must be involved. So it's, it's a very top de uh, decision uh, project in the, in the beginning. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, who can initiate a European perspective is the EC Parliament and Commission. Uh, suggestion two and three uh, are very tight co uh, connected. First of all, we have to create the rails for uh, and uh, create incentives for developing uh, European and in the long run international infrastructure standards for collecting post-marketing data of relevance for all stakeholders. And even the, here, uh, healthcare governments Academy companies, patients and EMA must be involved and the initiator must be uh, the Parliament and Commission in EC. And number three is to go further with suggestion two. It's to create incents, uh, incentives for development uh, European and international standards for analyzing post-marketing collection of knowledge from the data systems in healthcare, I mean, real life data, or what you call it. And the same actors must be involved and the same actor must initiate. And the next slide, please. Is that the next slide? No? Thank you. Um, I think this will contribute uh, to create evidence-based price setting and uh, knowledge uh, and uh, also evidence-based knowledge of clinical value. Uh, the first CSM gives also more evidence-based for equal and fair use of uh, the treatments. 
and improve uh, affordability and access for the patients. Um, number two, suggestion two, also create evidence-based pricing and uh, no, that's wrong. Uh, this creates evidence-based uh, price setting and uh, knowledge of clinical value. That's right. So we, we must know what uh, a new drug is really worth in, 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 in when it's uh, coming to healthcare post-marketing. And it contributes to more equal cancer care by giving more evidence based on e to, to prioritize and give equal and fair use of uh, the drugs. Uh, and um, they will also improve the patient's quality of life by creating possibility for collecting patient generating data. And that's also suggestion three. Have I uh, 10 seconds left? And uh, these are gone now. Now you can yeah. say it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Tomorrow morning we talk more about equal access to medications and cancer care. And, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this too. Now it's time for workshop D. Yes, long-term care for cancer survivors. Dr. Ulla Martinsson from Uppsala University Hospital. Welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm an oncologist and uh, doing uh, pediatric radiation therapy, and I also work at our late effect clinic. Can I have the next slide, please? And uh, in our workshop, which was uh, rather big, we were around 50 people in it, uh, we thought that the main or the head person is of course the patient and that's the most important person that we have to deal with and uh, therefore it's important to bring the patient's perspective uh, into this and we have to engage in patients uh, in the we have to engage the patients in the development of guidelines and in the healthcare services uh, but it's also important to remember the patient's social network, and that can be anything from a few relatives to a whole community. That depends on the setting of the patient. And we also talked about the use of the technology, and uh, uh, think it's very important that technology uh, is uh, patient uh, w the patient needs uh, drive that, not the doctor's needs or the healthcare system's needs. Next slide. Uh, we also think that Im it's important, even for countries uh, with uh, low and middle income uh, countries, uh, to have late effect clinics or at least to monitor for late effects, uh, even if they cannot uh, afford very fancy treatment. Uh, they don't have to do like we did in Sweden and England and the United States and so on to uh, treat patients for 30 years. And now all of a sudden we realize that, oops, uh, they have a lot of side effects and we need to take care of them. This has to be uh, done in parallel. And uh, we also think that you should remember that we don't have to reinvent the, uh, the wheel more than once. And uh, for example, we could learn a lot from stroke rehabilitation uh, when we try to rehabilitate uh, cancer patients. Uh, what is also important is that we don't only look at the medical needs for the patients, or the somatic needs, but have a more holistic approach. And it's uh, very important to have multidisciplinary and multi-professional teams to do this work with the patients. And also uh, to include uh, many societal issues as uh, 
the possibilities for the patients to get insurances and to get to work and so forth. Thank you. Thank you.